or so to uh, to learn a little Torah. Is that correct? Okay, or to learn a lot of Torah for that matter. Okay, it's good to see some of the people that I that I uh, know and love from before, and other people whose faces or their initials are new to me. In any event, what I'd like to do is to first of all to share screen for a minute um and um um let's see hold on just one second let's share the screen Does everyone see it now? You're able to see it? Yeah. Okay, great. So what I basically want to do here today is to focus a little bit on Parashat Zachor. Um, as, we, as, as we all know, we're going to be reading Parashat Zachor this coming week, where the Torah says, as you can see the Pasuk at the top on both sides here, Zachor, et asher sadacha amalek, what doesn't say when you're leaving Egypt, but um, and the Torah tells us after this battle, right, that one should not lo do not forget it. Um, I don't want to discuss today the question of the morality that's involved with this idea of eradicating. Um, Amalek. It's a very thorny issue, as I'm sure you're all aware, with many different reasons and ma many different explanations, some of them more convincing, some of them less convincing, some of them problematic in any event. Um, but what I want to point out is, a, if anyone, by the way, is interested in a really wonderful summary of uh, many different opinions through the generations, um, also uh, categorized um, Professor Avi Sagi um, printed in uh, the, uh, an article um, in the Harvard Theological uh, Review um, about 20 years ago or so, um, a uh, really um, an in-depth article on that, um, and I certainly recommend that article if you're interested in the topic. One approach, um, and I want to point out two things, okay? As I said, I don't even if I had more time at my disposal, I don't know if I'd want to discuss that issue. It's a, it is a very thorny issue, but I, I wanna point out a historical fact. Um, many of you may be aware of the idea amongst, uh, that's uh, in Chazal, of the fact that Haman comes from Amalek stock, the Haman Ha'agagi, after all, Agag is the name of the king that is uh, of Amalek, who um, Mordechai's ancestor, Shaul HaMelech, uh, does battle with, and that's the Haftarah that we'll be reading uh, this Shabbat. But the, um, and Haman is the descendant of Agag, the king. In other words, this is a, a theme or a sub-theme that one can view in the Megillah itself, or is that you have this continuing battle that um, had existed um, many generations before, um, some 500 to 600 years earlier, that uh, of, uh, of Shaul against Agag, and now round two, as it were, is the sequel. We have the return of Amalek, okay? Something along those lines. That would be the, the way of looking at it. Um, However, if you look at Divrei Hayamim, you'll see that the, uh, there the, uh, uh, the, the Sefer tells us that Amalek was actually, as a, an entity, was already eradicated beforehand. Um, and the, um, in the end of the uh, first uh, Beit HaMikdash, Amalek drops out as being an enemy of the Jews. Basically, it seems as though they don't exist anymore. But even if they do exist, Haga, um, the, um, even Haman, he's not, a, he's not coming in, he may be coming in Amalek, um, I guess, as an Amaleki in the sense that he's coming to try to eradicate B'nai Israel, but he is not coming as a 
representative of the tribe. He's not being presented in the Megillah as being Amalek, and here we're battling Amalek. It's a, uh, if, if you will, it's a theme um, which is perhaps an underlying theme, um, a, a sub-theme, if you will, which is, um, which is in the, in the storyline, but it's not a, a, a primary theme of the story, certainly not as Amalek per se, because Amalek as an entity doesn't really exist anymore. And Amalek as an entity, even if it did exist at the time of Haman, excuse me, Amalek doesn't um, really um, exist after the time of Haman. You don't have any indication of a, an Amalek that's living during the time of, let's say, the second temple beyond, there isn't an Amalek that is lurking in the background. So the discussion in terms of eradication of an Amalek and the moral quandary that it poses, which is an important issue to deal with, is really a theoretical issue. Um, certainly from the time of the first temple, um, and beyond, even in the story of Amal here in Amalek um, of Haman, the, there isn't any indication that we have to go out and hunt down every single descendant of Amalek and kill them. We're fighting the enemies of the Jews who are trying to kill the Jews, and quite a few will be killed in the Megillah, 75,000. But the um, ethnic element of Amalek, that's not mentioned, that doesn't seem to be a theme. We even have a Gemara, the Gemara says um, that the descendants of Haman um, taught Torah in B'nai Brak. In other words, that Tanaim are descendants of Haman. There's Haman, some, at a certain point, Haman's descendants, or some of them at least, converted to Judaism. And they became uh, Tanaim. There wasn't. A, there's no indication that anyone was trying to hunt them down and somehow, you know, without letting the rabbanut know or whatever it was, didn't tell the, you know, they didn't tell the the uh, the, the rabbi who's doing the uh, gerut that oh, I'm an Amaleki. Uh, it could be that uh, it was known. It wasn't something which was a an issue. Um, so if it's a theoretical issue, why do we keep reading it? That's the that's the question I want to 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 focus on. That is a long introduction to a simple question. Why do we keep reading it today? It, it really um, isn't, a, um, isn't really a, a, a burning issue on anyone uh, of ours, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I speak for myself, uh, agenda. Um, why do we have this mitzvah that the way that we understand it, that once a year we should go and um, read um, and there are all questions that are going around, especially this year when minyanim is not something that can be taken for granted. How do we fulfill the mitzvah, um, etc.? Why do we have this mitzvah? Why does the Torah tell us zachor to remember and lo tishkach don't forget? This is something which is really very much um, deeply um, troubling if you think about it as to why we should have this mitzvah in the first place. Now. One approach, basic approach to the, um, to the moral quandary is certainly in terms of the um, continuation is a, to view Amalek not as a, um, a nation and not as an ethnic uh, identity, but as something, as an idea which is being uh, an ideological issue that we are battling against. Um, there are several um, uh, uh, ideas that are thrown about. I want to focus on, because it is a, um, we don't have that much time at our disposal. I want to focus on a lesser known um, idea, something which comes across in this drasha that um, from Rav Moshe Feinstein. Um, it's a, if the, in his collection of Drashot, which is published under the title Derash Moshe, um, and it's also in English. The, this particular translation to uh, on the left of the screen is my own translation, something that I put together uh, just this afternoon, actually. 
but the because I don't have the, uh, uh, the the English art school copy uh, to work with. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree with their translation. I might disagree with some of the things that they wrote. Might agree totally. I have no idea. But I, this was my translation. If you're interested in looking at the translation in English, it is available um, through the Art Scroll Press, or you can look at the original Hebrew, which is to the right of the screen. It's a short Russia. Now, what is um, I want to just look at one part of this. Just this is printed on the bottom. Um, of the original note, if you take a look, it is the, this is taken from, it's an extract from the drasha, which was delivered in Parshat Zachor in February 1939, um, in commemoration of the sequicentennial, that's the 150th, for the, uh, for, for the, uh, your understanding, of 150th um, anniversary of the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution was ratified in uh, 1788, 1789. Ramosha Feinstein, who um, was an emigre to the United States, he was born in Tsarist Russia in the area which is currently in uh, Belarus and um, was taken over by the Soviets in 1917, one of the areas that was a bordering with Poland. He was on the Soviet side of the border. Um, in the, uh, he was born in 1895. Um, so as a young rabbi in 19, uh, he had lived through World War I, then the Soviet Revolution um, and the Soviet takeover of that area. For the first decade or so, he was like most rabbis were able to more or less uh, continue to um, practice even though obviously the communism, communists from the, from the get-go were fiercely atheistic. Um, however, the real crackdown um, came in the late 1920s, in the Stalinist purges. His brother actually was, um, uh, was exiled to Siberia um, and never returned um, for the crime basically of teaching Torah. Um, he continued to act as a Rav in, um, in Belarusia um, and was, um, he was perhaps known as one of the last rabbis, practicing rabbis in the Soviet Union. Um, and he came to the United States um, in 1936. It's important to know that when he emigrated, he had been offered a position, a very prestigious position um, in, um, in Latvia, uh, which is just to the, the north of Belarusia, um, and um, is part, was, it was Latvia, politically speaking, from a Jewish perspective, it was the heart of uh, Lithuania, um, right. in Davidsk, um, in, which was the seat of uh, uh, some pre very prestigious rabbanim had been there uh, beforehand. And he was offered the, um, the rabbinate in Davinsk, uh, which was still an independent state at that point between the wars. He turned down the position um, and uh, presumably because he saw some writing on the wall. Once he doesn't, it's not clear whether he saw the rise of fascism at that point, because that's the time in the 1930s, of course, when Hitler is on the rise uh, to the West or that he saw the, uh, the Soviets moving in. Um, either way, he decided that he would prefer to be in the United States. Um, he had no position to go to. He even said that he would rather sweep the streets in uh, the United States rather than take a rabbinic position in Davinsk. Um, and that's the background, okay? So this is two years after he's arrived to the United States and he's giving a drasha on Parshat Zachor um, and with, and this is, as I said, recorded in the book that he is the occasion of the drasha isn't even Parshat Zachor as much as it is the 150th anniversary of the establishment of the United States Constitution. Um, and that is what Rav Moshe is speaking about on this particular Parshat Zachor. I'll also mention one other little fact, which um, is even lesser known than what I just told you, is that um, and this is only something that came to my attention uh, about a year ago when I saw a, a, an unrelated article about something. Two weeks before he gave this drasha, 
in Madison Square Garden, which is the um, one of the major sports arenas and uh, general arenas in New York City, um, there were about it was a packed house uh, with about twenty thousand people in attendance of a rally for the American Nazi Party. Okay, and the American Nazi Party was uh, had a rally which was taking which had uh, an, one of the a protester against the rally. Um, uh, was killed at that uh, protest. Um, there's a rise in fascism in the United States as well at this point. Um, and at that rally, just as I said, just two weeks before this drasha is given, um, the, um, there is a large uh, picture, two large portraits are, um, are at the podium, one of uh, George Washington um, and the other of Adolf Hitler. Okay, so this is um, the New York of 1939. Um, and this is when Rav Moshe is giving this drasha. Okay, this is uh, important now to, to take a look. So here with this in mind, in the 11 minutes or so that we have left, so I wanna take a look at the drasha. Um, and in this drasha, Rav Moshe asked the question that I asked, namely, why should we be still reading this uh, parsha, and why do we have this mitzvah to this very day? And then he connects it with another aspect. Uh, this year it doesn't fall out almost always. Uh, parsha Zachor will fall out in parsha Titzaveh, not on parsha Truma, the way that it uh, does this year. And he connects it to parsha Titzaveh. In Titzaveh, the Torah talks opens with the idea of the commandment of making the menorah um, and the uh, not even so much making the menorah but the oil for the menorah and the uh, the menorah itself is in parsha truma and the with regard to the oil of the menorah there is a specific command that it be pure oil here clear oil of beaten olives which is translates as katik le maor um, that idea, that clear oil, means that there are no dregs. It's the very first press of the oil, of the olives, before there can be any um, impurity that gets into the oil, as opposed to other oils, and this is um, an important note, in the Beit HaMikdash, you could use other oils, or is the same oil with a little bit less uh, purity, a, a lower purity level, that it would have dregs, um, for other uses in the Beit HaMikdash, uh, for, let's say, uh, mixing in with the, the flower offering, the Korban Mincha. But the oil that's used for the menorah has to be that first press, the Katit Le Maor. And, the, um, and there are specific halachot that are involved with it, which we won't get into right now. And Ramosha asks the question, why should this oil be so necessary? Why should it be... What difference does it make? Oil is oil. It will burn and light regardless of whether there are dregs or there aren't dregs. Why should we care um, whether the, this oil is this pure oil without the dregs at all? And then he says the following. Um, so I'll read it, I guess, in the, both in the Hebrew and the English, and you can follow along in whichever one you prefer. Um, the, um, he says the following. Humitam. So he says, there is no such thing as an ideology which is presented in the world, which doesn't present itself as being an enlightening um, um, uh, 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 ideology. There's a lot to be said for communism. There's a lot to be said for fascism, for that matter. In other words, there, there's a reason why each one of them had tens of millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions of adherents. Um, there is a, um, and now obviously we don't have time to get into the the positive elements of both. Um, and he says, no ideology comes out and says, oh, we're a false ideology, please follow us. Obviously, the adherents of the ideology believe in the value of the ideology. But, and this is the important uh, point, 
Um, however, and now I'll go to the English side, however, when a significant percentage of the population are unconvinced, the proponents of the ideology resort to violence, and in his term, he uses the cherev v'chanit, the spear and the sword, or the, the point of the bayonet, if you will, to force their beliefs and systems upon others. Whereas the, there is a, um, when you have a, um, this, uh, uh, an ideological uh, debate, so when people are convinced, they're convinced. And when those people who aren't convinced, to use Lenin's famous uh, adage, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. So the idea is that, OK, so then there will be violence. If there needs be, there's, if there's no other way, then you're going to have to um, purge the, the people ahead of you. Now, this, Rav Moshe says, this represents the dregs of the ideology. This represents the, um, the, the, the part of the, uh, the oil, if you will, that doesn't illuminate, but is something which is like the uh, sediment at the end of the, at the bottom of the oil, is something which is impure and has no business being in oil in the first place, something that you should be filtering out. Um, this is, this, Rav Moshe says, is the idea of the um, of ideological dreads. Now, he goes on and he connects it directly to what's going on in his time. And he says that basically, this is what happens whether you're dealing from the right side of the ideological map in terms of the fascists, or you're dealing with the left side in terms of the communists. And other people have pointed out that the difference between these two become not 180 degree differences, um, that they're at the end of this, uh, the, the opposite ends of the spectrum, but rather they become 360 degree differences and they end up meeting at the same point. Rav Moshe says, in effect, that these, these ideologies meet at the same point, which is the point of the sword, the point of the bayonet. When either side, whether it be it communism or be it fascism, is, um, meets with its enemies, so then the enemy finds itself either in the gulag or finds itself in the concentration camp. That is the idea of the, that is the uh, idea of the, um, uh, the dregs uh, of the oil. Now this, he continues and says, is the opposite. He, and then he asks a very important question. He says, if that's the case, you know, are we really all that different? Because how, when we have come with our opponents of Torah Judaism, so we also have coercion. We also will um, perhaps intimidate those people who are not willing, if we have a Jewish halachic state, we would perhaps intimidate those people who would not be willing to keep halacha. So if that's the case, how are we different than the people that we despise? How are we different than the, the communists? Um, how are we different um, than the Nazis? And here, Rav Moshe makes the following um, claim that the, um, namely, that the, um, uh, here it's in the bold in the Hebrew, Rav Moshe says that our belief has to come through persuasion and influence and not through power. That is the, the difference. That the, um, the notion of our uh, ideological belief is one of impacting on the world and having an open debate with the world, perhaps, but never enforcing our idea. And he points out how, um, in terms of halakha, so we never, as opposed to Christianity, he doesn't mention Christianity or Islam by name, but both of them were able to and willing to um, convert um, at the point of the sword. We never um, accepted that, even when we had the power to do so in the time of David and Shlomo. Our belief is that people who want to join us will join us or welcome to join us, but only if they are coming 
from totally uh, from totally their free will without any ulterior motive. And he points out that also even with internally, when we have capital crimes, let's say for Avodah Zarah, it's almost impossible to actually enforce that. In other words, our system is one of education. We are not trying to uh, enforce our ideas upon anyone. We are trying to impress those ideas by impressing the people who are listening to us. And that is the difference. The difference is not one of, we don't have our dregs, if you will. We're, our oil, our menorah has to burn with the shemen katit. With that in mind, he now connects it to Amalek. And he comes and he says that this is why it's so important for us to be reading Zachor today. Because Amalek also had an ideological ax to grind. Um, without getting to his sources, he doesn't actually mention the sources in the drasha, but, but Amalek has one aspect of Amalek, certainly in Chazal, is that it disagreed with the notion that there was a, um, a divine source for, uh, or a divine influence in, in, the, in, in history. They argued that everything that had occurred in Egypt was happenstance. And that's why they were willing to attack um, Am Yisrael fresh out of Egypt, in effect, to show that they were unimpressed. We are unimpressed. This is not something which is happening because of the... Um, because of God or any great divine power, but simply because of a of a natural process. Now, if um, Rav Moshe now makes the following argument, um, which is really uh, pretty incredible, he says, Amalek waged war out of the ideological purpose. Amalek wishes to show that the exit has not been grabbed in the supernatural. Therefore, there was nothing to fear before, before Israel. It would have been appropriate to engage in a debate as the, to the possibility of God's intervention in this world and to convince or be convinced. Instead, Amalek resorted to violence. To um, the role of religion, the role of God, and to take Marx's favorite, famous line of, um, uh, of, of religion being the opium of the masses, that's something to be discussed. That's something that we can have a discussion on. Convince us. Or, if not, be convinced. However, Amalek chose to attack. And that is, in effect, what the communists are doing. That's in effect what the Nazis are doing. So this is a the the idea that is being said here is the um, is the that Amalek is the archetype for ideologies that are unwilling to be Shemen Zayid Zach. And with this in mind, and now I realize I'm just about out of time because this is something that we I would love to have more of a discussion with you about in terms of its uh, application today. But I'll leave that for you to think about in terms of the different ideologies and the different debates in our world and what we can do in that world. But he plays it here in 1938-39 to the 150th anniversary of the Constitution. And he basically makes a case for liberal democracy and says that given this fact, the only true government which can be um, uh, which, uh, short of the Torah government, which can be um, uh, supported by a Torah person, is a liberal democracy. And he uses the United States as the example for this. The idea that you have a environment that enables freedom of expression for every individual and for every group to be able to bring out their shemen, if you will, and have that light that that shemen is supposed to provide to um, to to bring it to, into the light of the sun, if you will, so that you can have a debate about the values of the different ideologies. 
the role of a uh, of a government is to create a safe civil uh, environment where that uh, debate can take place. And the moment that the debate verges into uh, violence and verges into um, a um, an, an ideological um, argument where there is no chance for any meaningful discussion, so then you're get, you're slipping into the world of Amalek. So his argument is that the United States or any I would say any uh, Western liberal democracy is the um, is the uh, is the uh, we'll say is the uh, environment in which a, um, a debate of the, uh, a, 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 where the Shemen Zayed Zach is able to, uh, to burn bright. So as I said, I wish I had, we had a little more time because I would love to hear your thoughts based on, first of all, on the drasha itself, but also um, its application in today's world where one might make a, a good argument that uh, for the first time um, since the 1930s, that we have the same kind of ideological split um, and it's impacting the same way that it did in the 1930s um, in the liberal democracies themselves. The, uh, whether it's the uh, situation where you have the, uh, the, the rally that I spoke about um, at the beginning of this year taking place uh, right before this drasha is given or um, events that have been taking place in the last few months, the last few years um, in our democracies. So that's the, uh, the shear for tonight. I'm happy to, to stay on uh, if anyone wants to talk, but um, my, otherwise my time is up. Thank you so much, Ralph Sussman. Um, I guess um, before I conclude, I, I'll ask if anyone has any questions. Um, I think we've got time for one or two, um, if anyone has. Um, I can't see everyone, so if you if you want to speak, feel free. To yourself. Um, otherwise, I will say thank you so so much, Ralph Sussman. That was really really interesting. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ralph Sussman is the uh, Rosh Hashiva of Eretz. So uh, as a, as a proud alumnus of Eretz, it took me took me back to my to my glory days in classroom three. Um, so thank you so much for for uh, enlightening us, Ralph Sussman. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Please God. Um, okay.